Chapter Sixteen. It was not in Miss Crawford's power to talk Fanny into any real forgetfulness of what had passed. When the evening was over, she went to bed full of it, her nerves still agitated by the shock of such an attack from her cousin Tom, so public and so persevered in. And her spirit sinking under her aunt's unkind reflection and reproach, to be called into notice in such a manner, to hear that it was but the prelude to something so infinitely worse, to be told that she must do what was so impossible as to act, and then to have the charge of obstinacy and ingratitude follow it, enforced with such a hint at the dependence of her situation, had been too distressing at the time to make the remembrance when she was alone much less so, especially with the superadded dread of what the morrow might produce in continuation of the subject. Miss Crawford had protected her only for the time, and if she were applied to again among themselves, with all the authoritative urgency that Tom and Maria were capable of, and Edmund perhaps away, what should she do? She fell asleep before she could answer the question, and found it quite as puzzling when she awoke the next morning. The little white attic, which had continued her sleeping room ever since her first entering the family, proving incompetent to suggest any reply, she had recourse, as soon as she was dressed, to another apartment more spacious and more meet for walking about in and thinking, and of which she had now, for some time, been almost equally mistress. It had been their schoolroom, so called till the Miss Bertrams would not allow it to be called so any longer, and inhabited as such to a later period. There Miss Lee had lived, and there they had read and written and talked and laughed till within the last three years when she had quitted them. The room had then become useless, and for some time was quite deserted, except by Fanny, when she visited her plants or wanted one of the books which she was still glad to keep there, from the deficiency of space and accommodation in her little chamber above. But gradually, as her value for the comforts of it increased, she had added to her possessions. And spent more of her time there, and having nothing to oppose her, had so naturally and so artlessly worked herself into it that it was now generally admitted to be hers. The East Room, as it had been called ever since Maria Bertram was sixteen, was now considered Fanny's, almost as decidedly as the White Attic. The smallness of the one making the use of the other so evidently reasonable, that the Miss Bertrams, with every superiority in their own apartments which their own sense of superiority could demand, were entirely approving it, and Mrs. Norris, having stipulated for there never being a fire in it on Fanny's account, was tolerably resigned to her having the use of what nobody else wanted. Though the terms in which she sometimes spoke of the indulgence seemed to imply that it was the best room in the house, the aspect was so favourable that even without a fire it was habitable in many an early spring and late autumn morning to such a willing mind as Fanny's, and while there was a gleam of sunshine, she hoped not to be driven from it entirely. Even when winter came, the comfort of it in her hours of leisure was extreme. She could go there after anything unpleasant below, and find immediate consolation in some pursuit or some train of thought at hand. Her plants, her books, of which she had been a collector from the first hour of her commanding a shilling. Her writing desk and her works of charity and ingenuity were all within her reach, or, if indisposed for employment, 
if nothing but musing would do, she could scarcely see an object in that room which had not an interesting remembrance connected with it. Everything was a friend, or bore her thoughts to a friend. And though there had sometimes been much of suffering to her, though her motives had often been misunderstood, her feelings disregarded, and her comprehension undervalued, though she had known the pains of tyranny, of ridicule, and neglect, yet almost every recurrence of either had led to something consolatory. Her aunt Bertram had spoken for her, or Miss Lee had been encouraging, or what was yet more frequent or more dear, Edmund had been her champion and her friend. He had supported her cause, or explained her meaning. He had told her not to cry, or had given her some proof of affection which made her tears delightful. And the whole was now so blended together, so harmonized by distance, that every former affliction had its charm. The room was most dear to her, and she would not have changed its furniture for the handsomest in the house, though what had been originally plain had suffered all the ill usage of children, and its greatest elegancies and ornaments were a faded footstool of Julia's work, too ill done for the drawing-room, three transparencies made in a rage for transparencies for the three lower panes of one window, where Tintern Abbey held its station between a cave in Italy and a moonlight lake in Cumberland, a collection of family profiles thought unworthy of being anywhere else over the mantelpiece, and by their side, and pinned against the wall, a small sketch of a ship sent four years ago from the Mediterranean by William, with HMS Antwerp at the bottom, in letters as tall as the mainmast. To this nest of comforts Fanny now walked down to try its influence on an agitated, doubting spirit, to see if by looking at Edmund's profile she could catch any of his counsel, or by giving air to her geraniums she might inhale a breeze of mental strength herself. But she had more than fears of her own perseverance to remove. She had begun to feel undecided as to what she ought to do, and as she walked around the room her doubts were increasing. Was she right in refusing what was so warmly asked, so strongly wished for, what might be so essential to a scheme on which some of those to whom she owed the greatest complaisance had set their hearts? Was it not ill-nature? selfishness and a fear of exposing herself? And would Edmund's judgment, would his persuasion of Sir Thomas's disapprobation of the whole, be enough to justify her in a determined denial in spite of all the rest? It would be so horrible to her to act, that she was inclined to suspect the truth and purity of her own scruples, and as she looked around her, the claims of her cousins to being obliged, were strengthened by the sight of present upon present that she had received from them. The table between the windows was covered with work-boxes and netting-boxes, which had been given her at different times, principally by Tom, and she grew bewildered as to the amount of the debt which all these kind remembrances produced. A tap at the door roused her in the midst of this attempt to find her way to her duty, and her gentle come in was answered by the appearance of one before whom all her doubts were wont to be laid. Her eyes brightened at the sight of Edmund. "'Can I speak with you, Fanny, for a few minutes?' said he. "'Yes, certainly.' "'I want to consult. I want your opinion.' "'My opinion?' she cried, shrinking from such a compliment, highly as it gratified her. "'Yes, your advice and opinion. I do not know what to do. This acting scheme gets worse and worse, you see. They have chosen almost as bad a play as they could. 
and now to complete the business are going to ask the help of a young man very slightly known to any of us. This is the end of all the privacy and propriety which was talked about at first. I know no harm of Charles Maddox, but the excessive intimacy which must spring from his being admitted among us in this manner is highly objectionable, the more than intimacy, the familiarity. I cannot think of it with any patience, and it does appear to me an evil of such magnitude as must, if possible, be prevented. Do not you see it in the same light? Yes, but what can be done? Your brother is so determined. There is but one thing to be done, Fanny. I must take Anhal to myself. I am well aware that nothing else will quiet Tom. Fanny could not answer him. It is not at all what I like, he continued. No man can like being driven into the appearance of such inconsistency. After being known to oppose the scheme from the beginning, there is absurdity in the face of my joining them now, when they are exceeding their first plan in every respect. But I can think of no other alternative. Can you, Fanny? No, said Fanny slowly. Not immediately, but— But what? I see your judgment is not with me. Think it a little over. Perhaps you are not so much aware as I am of the mischief that may, of the unpleasantness that must, arise from a young man's being received in this manner, domesticated among us, authorized to come at all hours, and placed suddenly on a footing which must do away all restraints. To think only of the license which every rehearsal must tend to create— it is all very bad. Put yourself in Miss Crawford's place, Fanny. Consider what it would be like to act Amelia with a stranger. She has a right to be felt for, because she evidently feels for herself. I heard enough of what she said to you last night to understand her unwillingness to be acting with a stranger, and as she probably engaged in the part with different expectations— perhaps without considering the subject enough to know what was likely to be, it would be ungenerous. It would be really wrong to expose her to it. Her feelings ought to be respected. Does not it strike you so, Fanny? You hesitate. I am sorry for Miss Crawford, but I am more sorry to see you drawn into what you had resolved against, and what you are known to think will be disagreeable to my uncle. It will be such a triumph to the others. They will not have much cause of triumph, when they see how infamously I act. But, however, triumph there certainly will be, and I must brave it. But if I can be the means of restraining the publicity of the business, of limiting the exhibition, of concentrating our folly, I shall be well repaid. As I am now, I have no influence, I can do nothing. I have offended them, and they will not hear me. But when I have put them in good humour by this concession, I am not without hopes of persuading them to confine the representation within a much smaller circle than they are now in the high road for. This will be a material gain. My object is to confine it to Mrs. Rushworth and the Grants. Will not this be worth gaining? Yes, it will be a great point. But still it has not your approbation. Can you mention any other measure by which I have a chance of doing equal good? No, I cannot think of anything else. Give me your approbation, then, Fanny. I am not comfortable without it. Oh, cousin! If you are against me, I ought to distrust myself. And yet— But it is absolutely impossible to let Tom go on in this way— riding about the country in quest of anybody who can be persuaded to act, no matter whom. The look of a gentleman is to be enough. 
I thought you would have entered more into Miss Crawford's feelings. No doubt she will be very glad. It must be a great relief to her, said Fanny, trying for greater warmth of manner. She never appeared more amiable than in her behaviour to you last night. It gave her a very strong claim on my good will. She was very kind indeed, and I am glad to have her spared. She could not finish the generous effusion. Her conscience stopped her in the middle, but Edmund was satisfied. I shall walk down immediately after breakfast, said he, and am sure of giving pleasure there. And now, dear Fanny, I will not interrupt you any longer. You want to be reading. But I could not be easy till I had spoken to you and come to a decision. Sleeping or waking, my head has been full of this matter all night. It is an evil, but I am certainly making it less than it might be. If Tom is up, I shall go to him directly and get it over. And when we meet at breakfast, we shall all be in high good humour at the prospect of acting the fool together with such unanimity. You, in the meanwhile, will be taking a trip into China, I suppose. How does Lord McCartney go on? Opening a volume on the table and then taking up some others. And here are Crab's tales and the idler at hand to relieve you if you tire of your great book. I admire your little establishment exceedingly, and as soon as I am gone, you will empty your head of all this nonsense of acting, and sit comfortably down to your table. But do not stay here to be cold. He went. But there was no reading, no china, no composure for Fanny. He had told her the most extraordinary, the most inconceivable, the most unwelcome news, and she could think of nothing else. To be acting, after all his objections, objections so just and so public, after all that she had heard him say, and seen him look, and known him to be feeling, could it be possible? Edmund so inconsistent? Was he not deceiving himself? Was he not wrong? Alas, it was all Miss Crawford's doing. She had seen her influence in every speech, and was miserable. The doubts and alarms as to her own conduct, which had previously distressed her, and which had all slept while she listened to him, were become of little consequence now. This deeper anxiety swallowed them up. Things should take their course. She cared not how it ended. Her cousins might attack, but could hardly tease her. She was beyond their reach. And if at last obliged to yield, no matter. It was all misery now. CHAPTER Seventeen. It was, indeed, a triumphant day to Mr. Bertram and Maria. Such a victory over Edmund's discretion had been beyond their hopes, and was most delightful. There was no longer anything to disturb them in their darling project, and they congratulated each other in private on the jealous weakness to which they attributed the change, with all the glee of feelings gratified in every way. Edmund might still look grave, and say he did not like the scheme in general, and must disapprove the play in particular. Their point was gained, he was to act, and he was driven to it by the force of selfish inclinations only. Edmund had descended from that moral elevation which he had maintained before, and they were both as much the better as the happier for the descent. They behaved very well, however, to him on the occasion, betraying no exultation beyond the lines about the corners of the mouth, and seemed to think it as great an escape to be quit of the intrusion of Charles Maddox, as if they had been forced into admitting him against their inclination. To have it quite in their own family circle was what they had particularly wished. A stranger among them would have been the destruction of all their comfort. 
and when Edmund, pursuing that idea, gave a hint of his hope as to the limitation of the audience, they were ready, in the complaisance of the moment, to promise anything. It was all good humour and encouragement. Mrs. Norris offered to contrive his dress. Mr. Yates assured him that Anne Hult's last scene with the Baron admitted a good deal of action and emphasis, and Mr. Rushworth undertook to count his speeches. Perhaps, said Tom, Fanny may be more disposed to oblige us now. Perhaps you may persuade her. No, she is quite determined. She will certainly not act. Oh, very well. And not another word was said, but Fanny felt herself again in danger, and her indifference to the danger was beginning to fail her already. There were not fewer smiles at the parsonage than at the park on this change in Edmund. Miss Crawford looked very lovely in hers, and entered with such an instantaneous renewal of cheerfulness into the whole affair as could have but one effect on him. He was certainly right in respecting such feelings. He was glad he had determined on it. And the morning wore away in satisfactions very sweet, if not very sound. One advantage resulted from it to Fanny. At the earnest request of Miss Crawford, Mrs. Grant had, with her usual good humour, agreed to undertake the part for which Fanny had been wanted and this was all that occurred to gladden her heart during the day and even this when imparted by edmund brought a pang with it for it was miss crawford to whom she was obliged it was miss crawford whose kind exertions were to excite her gratitude and whose merit in making them was spoken of with a glow of admiration she was safe but peace and safety were unconnected here her mind had never been farther from peace. She could not feel that she had done wrong herself, but she was disquieted in every other way. Her heart and her judgment were equally against Edmund's decision. She could not acquit his unsteadiness, and his happiness under it made her wretched. She was full of jealousy and agitation. Miss Crawford came with looks of gaiety which seemed an insult, with friendly expressions towards herself which she could hardly answer calmly. Everybody around her was gay and busy, prosperous and important. Each had their object of interest, their part, their dress, their favourite scene, their friends and confederates, all were finding employment in consultations and comparisons, or diversion in the playful conceits they suggested. She alone was sad and insignificant. She had no share in anything. She might go or stay. She might be in the midst of their noise, or retreat from it to the solitude of the East Room, without being seen or missed. She could almost think anything would have been preferable to this. Mrs. Grant was of consequence. Her good nature had honourable mention. Her taste and her time were considered. Her presence was wanted. She was sought for and attended and praised. And Fanny was at first in some danger of envying her the character she had accepted. But reflection brought better feelings, and showed her that Mrs. Grant was entitled to respect which could never have belonged to her, and that had she received even the greatest, she could never have been easy in joining a scheme which, considering only her uncle, she must condemn altogether. Fanny's heart was not absolutely the only saddened one amongst them and she soon began to acknowledge herself. Julia was a sufferer too, though not quite so blamelessly. Henry Crawford had trifled with her feelings, but she had very long allowed and even sought his attentions with the jealousy of her sister so reasonable as ought to have been their cure. And now that the conviction of his preference for Maria had been forced on her, she submitted to it without any alarm for Maria's situation, or any endeavour at rational tranquillity for herself. 
She either sat in gloomy silence, wrapped in such gravity as nothing could subdue, no curiosity touch, no wit amuse, or allowing the attentions of Mr. Yates, was talking with forced gaiety to him alone, and ridiculing the acting of the others. For a day or two after the affront was given, Henry Crawford had endeavoured to do it away by the usual attack of gallantry and compliment, but he had not cared enough about it to persevere against a few repulses, and becoming soon too busy with his play to have time for more than one flirtation, he grew indifferent to the quarrel or rather thought it a lucky occurrence, as quietly putting an end to what might ere long have raised expectations in more than Mrs. Grant. She was not pleased to see Julia excluded from the play, and sitting by disregarded, but as it was not a matter which really involved her happiness, as Henry must be the best judge of his own, and as he did assure her, with a most persuasive smile, that neither he nor Julia had ever had a serious thought of each other, she could only renew her former caution as to the elder sister, entreat him not to risk his tranquillity by too much admiration there, and then gladly take her share in anything that brought cheerfulness to the young people in general, and that did so particularly promote the pleasure of the two so dear to her. "'I rather wonder Julia is not in love with Henry,' was her observation to Mary. "'I dare say she is,' replied Mary coldly. "'I imagine both sisters are.' "'Both?' "'No, no, that must not be. Do not give him a hint of it. Think of Mr. Rushworth.' "'You had better tell Miss Bertram to think of Mr. Rushworth. It may do her some good. I often think of Mr. Rushworth's property and independence, and wish them in other hands, but I never think of him. A man might represent the county with such an estate.' A man might escape a profession and represent the county. I dare say he will be in Parliament soon. When Sir Thomas comes, I dare say he will be in for some borough. But there has been nobody to put him in the way of doing anything yet. Sir Thomas is to achieve mighty things when he comes home, said Mary after a pause. Do you remember Hawkins Brown's address to tobacco, in imitation of Pope's blessed leaf, whose aromatic gales dispense to Templar's modesty, to parson's sense? I will parody them. Blessed night, whose dictatorial looks dispense to children affluence, to Rushworth sense. Will not that do, Mrs. Grant? Everything seems to depend upon Sir Thomas's return. "'You will find his consequence very just and reasonable when you see him in his family, I assure you. I do not think we do so well without him. He has a fine, dignified manner which suits the head of such a house, and keeps everybody in their place. Lady Bertram seems more of a cipher now than when he is at home, and nobody else can keep Mrs. Norris in order. But Mary— do not fancy that Maria Bertram cares for Henry. I am sure Julia does not, or she would not have flirted as she did last night with Mr. Yates. And though he and Maria are very good friends, I think she likes Southerton too well to be inconstant. I would not give much for Mr. Rushworth's chance if Henry stepped in before the articles were signed. If you have such a suspicion, something must be done, and as soon as the play is all over we will talk to him seriously, and make him know his own mind, and if he means nothing, we will send him off, though he is Henry, for a time. Julia did suffer, however, though Mrs. Grant discerned it not, and though it escaped the notice of many of her own family likewise. She had loved— she did love still, and she had all the suffering which a warm temper and a high spirit were likely to endure under the disappointment of a dear, though irrational, hope, with a strong sense of ill-usage. Her heart was sore and angry, 
and she was capable only of angry consolations. The sister with whom she was used to be on easy terms was now become her greatest enemy. They were alienated from each other, and Julia was not superior to the hope of some distressing end to the attentions which were still carrying on there, some punishment to Maria for conduct so shameful towards herself, as well as towards Mr. Rushworth. With no material fault of temper or difference of opinion to prevent their being very good friends while their interests were the same, the sisters, under such a trial as this, had not affection or principle enough to make them merciful or just, to give them honour or compassion. Maria felt her triumph, and pursued her purpose careless of Julia, and Julia could never see Maria distinguished by Henry Crawford without trusting that it would create jealousy and bring a public disturbance at last. Fanny saw and pitied much of this in Julia, but there was no outward fellowship between them. Julia made no communication, and Fanny took no liberties. They were two solitary sufferers, or connected only by Fanny's consciousness. The inattention of the two brothers and the aunt to Julia's discomposure, and their blindness to its true cause, must be imputed to the fullness of their own minds. They were totally preoccupied. Tom was engrossed by the concerns of his theatre, and saw nothing that did not immediately relate to it. Edmund, between his theatrical and his real part, between Miss Crawford's claims and his own conduct, between love and consistency, was equally unobservant, and Mrs. Norris was too busy in contriving and directing the general little matters of the company, superintending their various dresses with economical expedient, for which nobody thanked her, and saving, with delighted integrity, half a crown here and there to the absent Sir Thomas, to have leisure for watching the behaviour or guarding the happiness of his daughters. CHAPTER Eighteen. Everything was now in a regular train. Theatre, actors, actresses, and dresses were all getting forward. But though no other great impediments arose, Fanny found, before many days were passed, that it was not all uninterrupted enjoyment to the party themselves, and that she had not to witness the continuance of such unanimity and delight as had been almost too much for her at first. Everybody began to have their vexation. Edmund had many. Entirely against his judgment, a scene-painter arrived from town, and was at work, much to the increase of the expenses, and what was worse, of the éclat of their proceedings. And his brother, instead of being really guided by him as to the privacy of the representation, was giving an invitation to every family who came in his way. Tom himself began to fret over the scene-painter's slow progress, and to feel the miseries of waiting. He had learned his part, all his parts, for he took every trifling one that could be united with the butler, and began to be impatient to be acting, and every day thus unemployed was tending to increase his sense of the insignificance of all his parts together, and make him more ready to regret that some other play had not been chosen. Fanny, being always a very courteous listener, and often the only listener at hand, came in for the complaints and distresses of most of them. She knew that Mr. Yates was in general thought to rant dreadfully, that Mr. Yates was disappointed in Henry Crawford, that Tom Bertram spoke so quick he would be unintelligible, that Mrs. Grant spoiled everything by laughing, that Edmund was behindhand with his part, and that it was misery to have anything to do with Mr. Rushworth, who was wanting a prompter through every speech.' 
She knew also that poor Mr. Rushworth could seldom get anybody to rehearse with him. His complaint came before her as well as the rest, and so decided to her eye was her cousin Maria's avoidance of him, and so needlessly often the rehearsal of the first scene between her and Mr. Crawford, that she had soon all the terror of other complaints from him. So far from being all satisfied and all enjoying, she found everybody requiring something they had not, and giving occasion of discontent to the others. Everybody had a part either too long or too short. Nobody would attend as they ought. Nobody would remember on which side they were to come in. Nobody but the complainer would observe any directions. Fanny believed herself to derive as much innocent enjoyment from the play as any of them. Henry Crawford acted well, and it was a pleasure to her to creep into the theatre and attend the rehearsal of the first act, in spite of the feelings it excited in some speeches for Maria. Maria, she also thought, acted well. Too well. After the first rehearsal or two, Fanny began to be their only audience, and sometimes as prompter, sometimes as spectator, was often very useful. As far as she could judge, Mr. Crawford was considerably the best actor of all. He had more confidence than Edmund, more judgment than Tom, more talent and taste than Mr. Yates. She did not like him as a man but she must admit him to be the best actor, and on this point there were not many who differed from her. Mr. Yates, indeed, exclaimed against his tameness and insipidity, and the day came at last when Mr. Rushworth turned to her with a black look and said, "'Do you think there's anything so very fine in all this?' For the life and soul of me I cannot admire him, and between ourselves to see such an undersized little mean-looking man set up for a fine actor is very ridiculous in my opinion. From this moment there was a return of his former jealousy, which Maria, from increasing hopes of Crawford, was at little pains to remove and the chances of Mr. Rushworth's ever attaining to the knowledge of his two-and-forty speeches became much less. As to his ever making anything tolerable of them, nobody had the smallest idea of that except his mother. She, indeed, regretted that his part was not more considerable, and deferred coming over to Mansfield till they were forward enough in their rehearsal to comprehend all his scenes. But the others aspired at nothing beyond his remembering the catchword, and the first line of his speech, and being able to follow the prompter through the rest. Fanny, in her pity and kind-heartedness, was at great pains to teach him how to learn, giving him all the helps and directions in her power trying to make an artificial memory for him, and learning every word of his part herself, but without his being the much forwarder. Many uncomfortable, anxious, apprehensive feelings she certainly had, but with all these, and other claims on her time and attention, she was as far from finding herself without employment or utility amongst them as without a companion in uneasiness, quite as far from having no demand on her leisure as on her compassion. The gloom of her first anticipations was proved to have been unfounded. She was occasionally useful to all. She was, perhaps, as much at peace as any. There was a great deal of needlework to be done, moreover, in which her help was wanted, and that Mrs. Norris thought her quite as well off as the rest was evident by the manner in which she claimed it. "'Come, Fanny,' she cried, "'these are fine times for you, but you must not always be walking from one room to the other and doing the lookings-on at your ease in this way. I want you here.' 
I have been slaving myself till I can hardly stand to contrive Mr. Rushworth's cloak without sending for any more satin, and now I think you may give me your help in putting it together. There are but three seams. You may do them in a trice. It would be lucky for me if I had nothing but the executive part to do. You are best off, I can tell you. But if nobody did more than you, we should not get on very fast. Fanny took the work very quietly without attempting any defence, but her kinder aunt Bertram observed on her behalf, One cannot wonder, sister, that Fanny should be delighted. It is all new to her, you know. You and I used to be very fond of a play ourselves, and so am I still. And as soon as I am a little more at leisure, I mean to look in at their rehearsals too. What is the play about, Fanny? You have never told me. Oh, sister, pray do not ask her now, for Fanny is not one of those who can talk and work at the same time. It is about lover's vows. I believe, said Fanny to her aunt Bertram, there will be three acts rehearsed to-morrow evening, and that will give you an opportunity of seeing all the actors at once. "'You had better stay till the curtain is hung,' interposed Mrs. Norris. "'The curtain will be hung in a day or two. There is very little sense in a play without a curtain, and I am much mistaken if you do not find it draw up into very handsome festoons.' Lady Bertram seemed quite resigned to waiting. Fanny did not share her aunt's composure. She thought of the morrow a great deal, for if the three acts were rehearsed, Edmund and Miss Crawford would then be acting together for the first time. The third act would bring a scene between them which interested her most particularly, and which she was longing and dreading to see how they would perform. The whole subject of it was love. A marriage of love was to be described by the gentleman, and very little short of a declaration of love be made by the lady. She had read and read the scene again with many painful, many wandering emotions, and looked forward to their representation of it as a circumstance almost too interesting. She did not believe they had yet rehearsed it, even in private. The morrow came, the plan for the evening continued, and Fanny's consideration of it did not become less agitated. She worked very diligently under her aunt's directions, but her diligence and her silence concealed a very absent, anxious mind. And about noon she made her escape with her work to the East Room, that she might have no concern in another, and as she deemed it, most unnecessary rehearsal of the first act, which Henry Crawford was just proposing desirous at once of having her time to herself, and of avoiding the sight of Mr. Rushworth. A glimpse, as she passed through the hall, of the two ladies walking up from the parsonage, made no change in her wish of retreat, and she worked and meditated in the East Room undisturbed for a quarter of an hour, when a gentle tap at the door was followed by the entrance of Miss Crawford. "'Am I right? Yes, this is the East Room. My dear Miss Price, I beg your pardon, but I have made my way to you on purpose to entreat your help.' Fanny, quite surprised, endeavoured to show herself mistress of the room by her civilities, and looked at the bright bars of her empty grate with concern. "'Thank you. I am quite warm, very warm. Allow me to stay here a little while, and do have the goodness to hear me my third act. I have brought my book, and if you would but rehearse it with me, I should be so obliged. I came here to-day intending to rehearse it with Edmund, by ourselves, against the evening, but he is not in the way.' and if he were, I do not think I could go through it with him till I have hardened myself a little, for really there is a speech or two. You will be so good, won't you?' 
Fanny was most civil in her assurances, though she could not give them in a very steady voice. "'Have you ever happened to look at the part I mean?' continued Miss Crawford, opening her book. "'Here it is. I did not think much of it at first, but, upon my word, there, look at that speech, and that, and that. How am I ever to look at him in the face and say such things? Could you do it? But then he is your cousin, which makes all the difference. You must rehearse it with me, that I may fancy you him and get on by degrees. You have a look of his sometimes. Have I? I will do my best with the greatest readiness, but I must read the part, for I can say very little of it. None of it, I suppose. You are to have the book, of course. Now for it. We must have two chairs at hand for you to bring forward to the front of the stage. There, very good schoolroom chairs, not made for a theatre, I dare say. Much more fitted for little girls to sit in and kick their feet against when they are learning a lesson. What would your governess and uncle say to see them used for such a purpose? Could Sir Thomas look in upon us just now, he would bless himself, for we are rehearsing all over the house. Yates is storming away in the dining-room, I heard him as I came upstairs, and the theatre is engaged, of course, by those indefatigable rehearsers, Agatha and Frederick. If they are not perfect, I shall be surprised. By the by— I looked in upon them five minutes ago, and it happened to be exactly at one of the times when they were trying not to embrace, and Mr. Rushworth was with me. I thought he began to look a little queer, so I turned it off as well as I could by whispering to him, "'We shall have an excellent Agatha. There is something so maternal in her manner, so completely maternal in her voice and countenance.' Was not that well done of me? He brightened up directly. Now for my soliloquy. She began, and Fanny joined in with all the modest feeling which the idea of representing Edmund was so strongly calculated to inspire, but with looks and voice so truly feminine as to be no very good picture of a man. With such an anhalt, however, Miss Crawford had courage enough, and they had got through half the scene when a tap at the door brought a pause, and the entrance of Edmund the next moment suspended it all. Surprise, consciousness, and pleasure appeared in each of the three on this unexpected meeting, and as Edmund was come on the very same business that had brought Miss Crawford, Consciousness and pleasure were likely to be more than momentary in them. He too had his book, and was seeking Fanny to ask her to rehearse with him, and help him prepare for the evening, without knowing Miss Crawford to be in the house. And great was the joy and animation of being thus thrown together, of comparing schemes, and sympathizing in praise of Fanny's kind offices. She could not equal them in their warmth. Her spirits sank under the glow of theirs, and she felt herself becoming too nearly nothing to both, to have any comfort in having been sought by either. They must now rehearse together. Edmund proposed, urged, entreated it, till the lady, not very unwilling at first, could refuse no longer and Fanny was wanted only to prompt and observe them. She was invested, indeed, with the office of judge and critic, and earnestly desired to exercise it, and tell them all their faults. But from doing so, every feeling within her shrank. She could not, would not, dared not attempt it. Had she been otherwise qualified for criticism, her conscience must have restrained her from venturing at disapprobation. She believed herself to feel too much of it in the aggregate for honesty or safety in particulars. To prompt them must be enough for her. 
and it was sometimes more than enough, for she could not always pay attention to the book. In watching them she forgot herself, and, agitated by the increasing spirit of Edmund's manner, had once closed the page and turned away exactly as he wanted help. It was imputed to very reasonable weariness, and she was thanked and pitied. But she deserved their pity more than she hoped they would ever surmise. At last the scene was over and Fanny forced herself to add her praise to the compliments each was giving the other. And when again alone, and able to recall the whole, she was inclined to believe their performance would indeed have such nature and feeling in it as must ensure their credit, and make it a very suffering exhibition to herself. Whatever might be its effect, however, she must stand the brunt of it again that very day. The first regular rehearsal of the three first acts was certainly to take place in the evening. Mrs. Grant and the Crawfords were engaged to return for that purpose as soon as they could after dinner, and every one concerned was looking forward with eagerness. There seemed a general diffusion of cheerfulness on the occasion. Tom was enjoying such an advance towards the end, Edmund was in spirits from the morning's rehearsal, and little vexation seemed everywhere smoothed away. All were alert and impatient. The ladies moved soon, the gentlemen soon followed them, and with the exception of Lady Bertram, Mrs. Norris, and Julia, everybody was in the theatre at an early hour and having lighted it up as well as its unfinished state admitted, were waiting only the arrival of Mrs. Grant and the Crawfords to begin. They did not wait long for the Crawfords, but there was no Mrs. Grant. She could not come. Dr. Grant, professing an indisposition, for which he had little credit with his fair sister-in-law, could not spare his wife. "'Dr. Grant is ill,' said she with mock solemnity. "'He has been ill ever since he did not eat any of the pheasant to-day. "'He fancied it tough, sent away his plate, and has been suffering ever since.' "'Here was disappointment. "'Mrs. Grant's non-attendance was sad indeed. "'Her pleasant manners and cheerful conformity made her always valuable amongst them. But now she was absolutely necessary. They could not act, they could not rehearse with any satisfaction without her. The comfort of the whole evening was destroyed. What was to be done? Tom, as cottager, was in despair. After a pause of perplexity, some eyes began to be turned towards Fanny, and a voice or two to say, if Miss Price would be so good as to read the part— she was immediately surrounded by supplications. Everybody asked it. Even Edmund said, "'Do, Fanny, if it is not very disagreeable to you.' But Fanny still hung back. She could not endure the idea of it. Why was not Miss Crawford to be applied to as well? Or why had not she rather gone to her own room, as she had felt to be the safest, instead of attending the rehearsal at all? She had known it would irritate and distress her. She had known it her duty to keep away. She was properly punished. "'You have only to read the part,' said Henry Crawford, with renewed entreaty. "'And I do believe she can say every word of it,' added Maria, "'for she could put Mrs. Grant right the other day in twenty places. Fanny, I am sure you know the part.' Fanny could not say she did not, and as they all persevered, as Edmund repeated his wish, and with a look of even fond dependence on her good nature, she must yield. She would do her best. Everybody was satisfied, and she was left to the tremors of a most palpitating heart, while the others prepared to begin.' 
They did begin, and being too much engaged in their own noise to be struck by unusual noise in the other part of the house, had proceeded some way when the door of the room was thrown open, and Julia appearing at it with a face all aghast exclaimed, My father is come! He is in the hall at this moment! Chapter 19 how is the consternation of the party to be described? To the greater number it was a moment of absolute horror. Sir Thomas in the house! All felt the instantaneous conviction. Not a hope of imposition or mistake was harboured anywhere. Julia's looks were an evidence of the fact that made it indisputable and after the first starts and exclamations not a word was spoken for half a minute. Each with an altered countenance was looking at some other, and almost each was feeling it a stroke the most unwelcome, most ill-timed, most appalling. Mr. Yates might consider it only as a vexatious interruption for the evening, and Mr. Rushworth might imagine it a blessing, but every other heart was sinking under some degree of self-condemnation or undefined alarm. Every other heart was suggesting, What will become of us? What is to be done now? It was a terrible pause, and terrible to every ear, with the corroborating sounds of opening doors and passing footsteps. Julia was the first to move and speak again. Jealousy and bitterness had been suspended. Selfishness was lost in the common cause. But at the moment of her appearance, Frederick was listening with looks of devotion to Agatha's narrative, and pressing her hand to his heart. And as soon as she could notice this, and see that, in spite of the shock of her words, he still kept his station, and retained her sister's hand, her wounded heart swelled again with injury, and looking as red as she had been white before, she turned out of the room, saying, "'I need not be afraid of appearing before him.' Her going roused the rest and at the same moment the two brothers stepped forward, feeling the necessity of doing something. A very few words between them were sufficient. The case admitted no difference of opinion. They must go to the drawing-room directly. Maria joined them with the same intent, just then the stoutest of the three for the very circumstance which had driven Julia away was to her the sweetest support. Henry Crawford's retaining her hand at such a moment, a moment of such peculiar proof and importance, was worth ages of doubt and anxiety. She held it as an earnest of the most serious determination, and was equal even to encounter her father. They walked off, utterly heedless of Mr. Rushworth's repeated question of, "'Shall I go too? Had not I better go too? Will not it be right for me to go too?' But they were no sooner through the door than Henry Crawford undertook to answer the anxious inquiry, and encouraging him by all means to pay his respects to Sir Thomas without delay, sent him after the others with delighted haste. Fanny was left with only the Crawfords and Mr. Yates. She had been quite overlooked by her cousins, and as her own opinion of her claims on Sir Thomas's affection was much too humble to give her any idea of classing herself with his children, she was glad to remain behind and gain a little breathing time. Her agitation and alarm exceeded all that was endured by the rest by the right of a disposition which not even innocence could keep from suffering. She was nearly fainting. All her former habitual dread of her uncle was returning, and with it compassion for him, and for almost every one of the party on the developments before him, with solicitude on Edmund's account indescribable. She had found a seat, 
where in excessive trembling she was enduring all these fearful thoughts, while the other three, no longer under any restraint, were giving vent to their feelings of vexation, lamenting over such an unlooked-for premature arrival as a most untoward event, and without mercy wishing poor Sir Thomas had been twice as long on his passage, or were still in Antigua. The Crawfords were more warm on the subject than Mr. Yates, from better understanding the family, and judging more clearly of the mischief that must ensue. The ruin of the play was to them a certainty. They felt the total destruction of the scheme to be inevitably at hand, while Mr. Yates considered it only as a temporary interruption, a disaster for the evening and could even suggest the possibility of the rehearsal being renewed after tea, when the bustle of receiving Sir Thomas were over, and he might be at leisure to be amused by it. The Crawfords laughed at the idea, and having soon agreed on the propriety of their walking quietly home, and leaving the family to themselves, proposed Mr. Yates's accompanying them, and spending the evening at the parsonage. But Mr. Yates, having never been with those who thought much of parental claims or family confidence, could not perceive that anything of the kind was necessary, and therefore thanking them, said he preferred remaining where he was, that he might pay his respects to the old gentleman handsomely since he was come and besides, he did not think it would be fair by the others to have everybody run away. Fanny was just beginning to collect herself, and to feel that if she stayed longer behind it might seem disrespectful, when this point was settled, and being commissioned with the brother and sister's apology, saw them preparing to go as she quitted the room herself, to perform the dreadful duty of appearing before her uncle. Too soon did she find herself at the drawing-room door, and after pausing a moment for what she knew would not come, for a courage which the outside of no door had ever supplied to her, she turned the lock in desperation, and the lights of the drawing-room and all the collected family were before her. As she entered, her own name caught her ear. Sir Thomas was at that moment looking round him and saying, "'But where is Fanny? I do not see my little Fanny.' And on perceiving her came forward with a kindness which astonished and penetrated her, calling her his dear Fanny, kissing her affectionately, and observing with decided pleasure how much she was grown. Fanny knew not how to feel, nor where to look. She was quite oppressed. He had never been so kind, so very kind to her in his life. His manner seemed changed, his voice was quick from the agitation of joy, and all that had been awful in his dignity seemed lost in tenderness. He led her nearer the light, and looked at her again, inquired particularly after her health, and then, correcting himself, observed that he need not inquire for her appearance spoke sufficiently on that point. A fine blush having succeeded the previous paleness of her face, he was justified in his belief of her equal improvement in health and beauty. He inquired next after her family, especially William, and his kindness altogether was such as made her reproach herself for loving him so little, and thinking his return a misfortune. And when, on having courage to lift her eyes to his face, she saw that he was grown thinner, and had the burned, fagged, worn look of fatigue and a hot climate, every tender feeling was increased, and she was miserable in considering how much unsuspected vexation was probably ready to burst on him. Sir Thomas was indeed the life of the party, who at his suggestion now seated themselves round the fire. He had the best right to be the talker, and the delight of his sensations in being again in his own house, 
in the centre of his family, after such a separation, made him communicative and chatty in a very unusual degree, and he was ready to give every information as to his voyage, and answer every question of his two sons almost before it was put. His business in Antigua had latterly been prosperously rapid, and he came directly from Liverpool, having had an opportunity of making his passage thither in a private vessel, instead of waiting for the packet. And all the little particulars of his proceedings and events, his arrivals and departures, were most promptly delivered, as he sat by Lady Bertram, and looked with heartfelt satisfaction on the faces around him interrupting himself more than once, however, to remark on his good fortune in finding them all at home, coming unexpectedly as he did, all collected together exactly as he could have wished, but dared not depend on. Mr. Rushworth was not forgotten. A most friendly reception and warmth of handshaking had already met him, and with pointed attention he was now included in the objects most intimately connected with Mansfield. There was nothing disagreeable in Mr. Rushworth's appearance, and Sir Thomas was liking him already. By not one of the circle was he listened to with such unbroken, unalloyed enjoyment as by his wife, who was really extremely happy to see him, and whose feelings were so warmed by his sudden arrival as to place her nearer agitation than she had been for the last twenty years. She had been almost fluttered for a few minutes, and still remained so sensibly animated as to put away her work, move Pug from her side, and give all her attention and all the rest of her sofa to her husband. She had no anxieties for anybody to cloud her pleasure. Her own time had been irreproachably spent during his absence. She had done a great deal of carpet-work, and made many yards of fringe, and she would have answered as freely for the good conduct and useful pursuits of all the young people as for her own. It was so agreeable to her to see him again, and hear him talk, to have her ear amused and her whole comprehension filled by his narratives, that she began particularly to feel how dreadfully she must have missed him, and how impossible it would have been for her to bear a lengthened absence. Mrs. Norris was by no means to be compared in happiness to her sister. Not that she was incommoded by many fears of Sir Thomas's disapprobation when the present state of his house should be known, for her judgment had been so blinded, that except by the instinctive caution with which she had whisked away Mr. Rushworth's pink satin cloak as her brother-in-law entered, she could hardly be said to show any sign of alarm. But she was vexed by the manner of his return. It had left her nothing to do. Instead of being sent for out of the room, and seeing him first, and having to spread the happy news throughout the house, Sir Thomas, with a very reasonable dependence perhaps on the nerves of his wife and children, had sought no confidant but the butler, and had been following him almost instantaneously into the drawing-room. Mrs. Norris felt herself defrauded of an office on which she had always depended, whether his arrival or his death were to be the thing unfolded and was now trying to be in a bustle without having anything to bustle about, and labouring to be important where nothing was wanted but tranquillity and silence. Would Sir Thomas have consented to eat, she might have gone to the housekeeper with troublesome directions, and insulted the footman with injunctions of dispatch. But Sir Thomas resolutely declined all dinner— he would take nothing, nothing till tea came. He would rather wait for tea. 
Still Mrs. Norris was at intervals urging something different, and in the most interesting moment of his passage to England, when the alarm of a French privateer was at the height, she burst through his recital with the proposal of soup. "'Sure, my dear Sir Thomas, a basin of soup would be a much better thing for you than tea. Do have a basin of soup.' Sir Thomas could not be provoked. "'Still the same anxiety for everybody's comfort, my dear Mrs. Norris,' was his answer. "'But indeed I would rather have nothing but tea.' "'Well, then, Lady Bertram, suppose you speak for tea directly. Suppose you hurry badly a little. He seems behind to-night.' She carried this point, and Sir Thomas's narrative proceeded. At length there was a pause— his immediate communications were exhausted, and it seemed enough to be looking joyfully around him, now at one, now at another of the beloved circle. But the pause was not long. In the elation of her spirits, Lady Bertram became talkative. And what were the sensations of her children upon hearing her say, "'How do you think the young people have been amusing themselves lately, Sir Thomas? "'They have been acting. "'We have all been alive with acting.' "'Indeed. "'And what have you been acting?' "'Oh, they'll tell you all about it.' "'The all will be soon told,' cried Tom hastily, and with affected unconcern. "'But it is not worth while to bore my father with it now.' "'You will hear enough of it to-morrow, sir. "'We have just been trying, by way of doing something, "'and amusing my mother, just within the last week, "'to get up a few scenes, a mere trifle. "'We have had such incessant rains, almost since October began, "'that we have been nearly confined to the house for days together. "'I have hardly taken out a gun since the third. "'Tolerable sport the first three days, "'but there has been no attempting anything since.' The first day I went over to Mansfield Wood, and Edmund took the copses beyond Easton, and we brought home six brace between us, and might each have killed six times as many, but we respect your pheasant, sir, I assure you, as much as you could desire. I do not think you will find your woods by any means worse stocked than they were. I never saw Mansfield Wood so full of pheasants in my life as this year. I hope you will take a day's sport there yourself, sir, soon." For the present the danger was over, and Fanny's sick feeling subsided. But when tea was soon afterwards brought in, and Sir Thomas, getting up, said that he found he could not be any longer in the house without just looking into his own dear room, every agitation was returning. He was gone before anything had been said to prepare him for the change he must find there, and a pause of alarm followed his disappearance. Edmund was the first to speak. "'Something must be done,' said he. "'It is time to think of our visitors,' said Maria, still feeling her hand pressed to Henry Crawford's heart, and caring little for anything else. "'Where did you leave Miss Crawford, Fanny?' Fanny told of their departure, and delivered their message. "'Then poor Yates is all alone,' cried Tom. "'I will go and fetch him. He will be no bad assistant when it all comes out.' To the theatre he went, and reached it just in time to witness the first meeting of his father and his friend. Sir Thomas had been a good deal surprised to find candles burning in his room, and on casting his eye round it to see other symptoms of recent habitation, and a general air of confusion in the furniture. The removal of the bookcase from before the billiard-room door struck him especially, but he had scarcely more than time to feel astonished at all this, before there were sounds from the billiard-room to astonish him still further. Some one was talking there in a very loud accent. He did not know the voice. More than talking, almost hallooing. He stepped to the door, rejoicing at that moment in having the means of immediate communication, and opening it, found himself on the stage of a theatre, 
and opposed to a ranting young man who appeared likely to knock him down backwards. At the very moment of Yates perceiving Sir Thomas, and giving perhaps the very best start he had ever given in the whole course of his rehearsals, Tom Bertram entered at the other end of the room, and never had he found greater difficulty in keeping his countenance. His father's looks of solemnity and amazement on this his first appearance on any stage, and the gradual metamorphosis of the impassioned Baron Wildenheim into the well-bred and easy Mr. Yates, making his bow and apology to Sir Thomas Bertram, was such an exhibition, such a piece of true acting, as he would not have lost upon any account. It would be the last, in all probability, the last scene on that stage. But he was sure there could not be a finer. The house would close with the greatest éclat. There was little time, however, for the indulgence of any images of merriment. It was necessary for him to step forward, too, and assist the introduction, and with many awkward sensations he did his best. Sir Thomas received Mr. Yates with all the appearance of cordiality which was due to his own character, but was really as far from pleased with the necessity of the acquaintance as with the manner of its commencement. Mr. Yates's family and connections were sufficiently known to him to render his introduction as the particular friend, another of the hundred particular friends of his son, exceedingly unwelcome and it needed all the felicity of being again at home, and all the forbearance it could supply, to save Sir Thomas from anger on finding himself thus bewildered in his own house, making part of a ridiculous exhibition in the midst of theatrical nonsense, and being forced in so untoward a moment to admit the acquaintance of a young man whom he felt sure of disapproving and whose easy indifference and volubility in the course of the first five minutes seemed to mark him the most at home of the two. Tom understood his father's thoughts, and heartily wishing he might always be as well disposed to give them but partial expression, began to see more clearly than he had ever done before that there might be some ground of offence that there might be some reason for the glance his father gave towards the ceiling and stucco of the room, and that when he inquired with mild gravity after the fate of the billiard-table, he was not proceeding beyond a very allowable curiosity. A few minutes were enough for such unsatisfactory sensations on each side, and Sir Thomas, having exerted himself so far as to speak a few words of calm approbation in reply to an eager appeal of Mr. Yates as to the happiness of the arrangement, the three gentlemen returned to the drawing-room together, Sir Thomas with an increase of gravity which was not lost on all. "'I come from your theatre, said he composedly as he sat down. "'I found myself in it rather unexpectedly. "'Its vicinity to my own room, but in every respect indeed it took me by surprise, "'as I had not the smallest suspicion of your acting having assumed so serious a character. "'It appears a neat job, however, as far as I could judge by candlelight, and does my friend Christopher Jackson credit? And then he would have changed the subject, and sipped his coffee in peace over domestic matters of a calmer hue. But Mr. Yates, without discernment to catch Sir Thomas's meaning, or diffidence, or delicacy, or discretion enough to allow him to lead the discourse, while he mingled among the others with the least obtrusiveness himself, would keep him on the topic of the theatre, would torment him with questions and remarks relative to it, and finally would make him hear the whole history of his disappointment at Ecclesford. Sir Thomas listened most politely, but found much to offend his ideas of decorum, 
and confirm his ill opinion of Mr. Yates's habits of thinking from the beginning to the end of the story, and when it was over, could give him no other assurance of sympathy than what a slight bow conveyed. This was, in fact, the origin of our acting," said Tom after a moment's thought. My friend Yates brought the infection from Ecclesford. And it spread as those things always spread, you know, sir. The faster, probably, from your having so often encouraged the sort of thing in us formerly, it was like treading old ground again. Mister Yates took the subject from his friend as soon as possible, and immediately gave Sir Thomas an account of what they had done and were doing. Told him of the gradual increase of their views, the happy conclusion of their first difficulties, and present promising state of affairs, relating everything with so blind an interest as made him not only totally unconscious of the uneasy movements of many of his friends as they sat, the change of countenance, the fidget, the hem of unquietness. But prevented him even from seeing the expression of the face on which his own eyes were fixed, from seeing Sir Thomas's dark brow contract as he looked with inquiring earnestness at his daughters and Edmund, dwelling particularly on the latter, and speaking a language, a remonstrance, a reproof, which he felt at his heart. Not less acutely was it felt by Fanny, who had edged back her chair behind her aunt's end of the sofa, and screened from notice herself, saw all that was passing before her. Such a look of reproach at Edmund from his father she could never have expected to witness, and to feel that it was in any degree deserved was an aggravation indeed. Sir Thomas's look implied. On your judgment, Edmund, I depended. What have you been about? She knelt in spirit to her uncle, and her bosom swelled to utter, "Oh, not to him! Look so to all the others, but not to him." Mister Yates was still talking. To own the truth, Sir Thomas, we were in the middle of a rehearsal when you arrived this evening. We were going through the first three acts, and not unsuccessfully, upon the whole. Our company is now so dispersed from the Crawfords being gone home that nothing more can be done tonight. But if you will give us the honour of your company tomorrow evening, I should not be afraid of the result. We bespeak your indulgence, you understand, as young performers. We bespeak your indulgence. My indulgence shall be given, sir," replied Sir Thomas gravely, "but without any other rehearsal." And with a relenting smile, he added, "I come home to be happy and indulgent." Then, turning away towards any or all of the rest, he tranquilly said, "Mister and Miss Crawford were mentioned in my last letters from Mansfield." Do you find them agreeable acquaintance? Tom was the only one at all ready with an answer, but he, being entirely without particular regard for either, without jealousy either in love or acting, could speak very handsomely of both. Mister Crawford was a most pleasant, gentlemanlike man; his sister a sweet, pretty, elegant, lively girl. Mister Rushworth could be silent no longer. I do not say he is gentlemanlike, considering, but you should tell your father he is not above five feet eight, or he will be expecting a well-looking man. Sir Thomas did not quite understand this, and looked with some surprise at the speaker. If I must say what I think, continued Mister Rushworth, in my opinion, it is very disagreeable to be always rehearsing. It is having too much of a good thing. I am not so fond of acting as I was at first. I think we are a great deal better employed sitting comfortably here among ourselves and doing nothing. Sir Thomas looked again and then replied with an approving smile, "I am happy to find our sentiments on this subject so much the same. It gives me sincere satisfaction." 
that I should be cautious and quick-sighted, and feel many scruples which my children do not feel, is perfectly natural, and equally so that my value for domestic tranquillity, for a home which shuts out noisy pleasures, should much exceed theirs. But at your time of life to feel all this is a most favourable circumstance for yourself and for everybody connected with you and I am sensible of the importance of having an ally of such weight. Sir Thomas meant to be giving Mr. Rushworth's opinion in better words than he could find himself. He was aware that he must not expect a genius in Mr. Rushworth, but as a well-judging, steady young man, with better notions than his elocution would do justice to, he intended to value him very highly. It was impossible for many of the others not to smile. Mr. Rushworth hardly knew what to do with such meaning, but by looking as he really felt, most exceedingly pleased with Sir Thomas's good opinion, and saying scarcely anything, he did his best towards preserving that good opinion a little longer. CHAPTER Twenty. Edmund's first object the next morning was to see his father alone, and give him a fair statement of the whole acting scheme, defending his own share in it as far only as he could then, in a soberer moment, feel his motives to deserve, and acknowledging with perfect ingenuousness that his concession had been attended with such partial good as to make his judgment in it very doubtful. He was anxious, while vindicating himself, to say nothing unkind of the others. But there was only one amongst them whose conduct he could mention without some necessity of defence or palliation. "'We have all been more or less to blame,' said he, "'every one of us, excepting Fanny. Fanny is the only one who has judged rightly throughout, who has been consistent.' Her feelings have been steadily against it from first to last. She never ceased to think of what was due to you. You will find Fanny everything you could wish. Sir Thomas saw all the impropriety of such a scheme among such a party, and at such a time, as strongly as his son had ever supposed he must. He felt it too much, indeed, for many words and having shaken hands with Edmund, meant to try to lose the disagreeable impression, and forget how much he had been forgotten himself, as soon as he could, after the house had been cleared of every object in forcing the remembrance, and restored to its proper state. He did not enter into any remonstrance with his other children. He was more willing to believe they felt their error than to run the risk of investigation. The reproof of an immediate conclusion of everything, the sweep of every preparation, would be sufficient. There was one person, however, in the house, whom he could not leave to learn his sentiments merely through his conduct. He could not help giving Mrs. Norris a hint of his having hoped that her advice might have been interposed to prevent what her judgment must certainly have disapproved. The young people had been very inconsiderate in forming the plan. They ought to have been capable of a better decision themselves. But they were young and excepting Edmund, he believed of unsteady characters. And with greater surprise, therefore, he must regard her acquiescence in their wrong measures, her countenance of their unsafe amusements, than that such measures and such amusements should have been suggested. Mrs. Norris was a little confounded, and as nearly being silenced as ever she had been in her life, for she was ashamed to confess having never seen any of the impropriety which was so glaring to Sir Thomas, and would not have admitted that her influence was insufficient, that she might have talked in vain. 
Her only resource was to get out of the subject as fast as possible, and turn the current of Sir Thomas's ideas into a happier channel. She had a great deal to insinuate in her own praise as to general attention to the interest and comfort of his family, much exertion and many sacrifices to glance at in the form of hurried walks and sudden removals from her own fireside, and many excellent hints of distrust and economy to Lady Bertram and Edmund to detail. Whereby a most considerable saving had always arisen, and more than one bad servant been detected. But her chief strength lay in Southerton. Her greatest support and glory was in having formed the connection with the Rushworths. There she was impregnable. She took to herself all the credit of bringing Mr. Rushworth's admiration of Maria to any effect. If I had not been active, said she, and made a point of being introduced to his mother, and then prevailed on my sister to pay the first visit, I am as certain as I sit here that nothing would have come of it, for Mr. Rushworth is the sort of amiable, modest young man who wants a great deal of encouragement, and there were girls enough on the catch for him if we had been idle. But I left no stone unturned. I was ready to move heaven and earth to persuade my sister, and at last I did persuade her. You know the distance to Southerton. It was in the middle of winter, and the roads almost impassable, but I did persuade her. I know how great, how justly great your influence is with Lady Bertram and her children. And am the more concerned that it should not have been, my dear Sir Thomas, if you had seen the state of the roads that day. I thought we should never have got through them, though we had the four horses, of course, and poor old coachman would attend us out of his great love and kindness, though he was hardly able to sit on the box on account of the rheumatism which I had been doctoring him for ever since Michaelmas. I cured him at last, but he was very bad all the winter, and this was such a day I could not help going to him up in his room before we set off to advise him not to venture. He was putting on his wig, so I said, Coachman, you had better not go. Your lady and I will be very safe. You know how steady Stephen is, and Charles has been upon the leader so often now that I am sure there is no fear. But, however, I soon found it would not do. He was bent upon going, and as I hate to be worrying and officious, I said no more. But my heart quite ached for him at every jolt, and when we got into the rough lanes about Stoke, where what with frost and snow upon beds of stones it was worse than anything you can imagine, I was quite in an agony about him. And then the poor horses, too, to see them straining away. You know how I always feel for the horses. And when we got to the bottom of Sandcroft Hill, what do you think I did? You will laugh at me, but I got out and walked up. I did indeed. It might not be saving them much, but it was something, and I could not bear to sit at my ease and be dragged up at the expense of those noble animals. I caught a dreadful cold, but that I did not regard. My object was accomplished in the visit. I hope we shall always think the acquaintance worth any trouble that might be taken to establish it. There is nothing very striking in Mr. Rushworth's manners, but I was pleased last night with what appeared to be his opinion on one subject, his decided preference of a quiet family party to the bustle and confusion of acting. He seemed to feel exactly as one could wish. Yes, indeed, and the more you know of him, the better you will like him. He is not a shining character, but he has a 
thousand good qualities, and is so disposed to look up to you that I am quite laughed at about it, for everybody considers it as my doing. Upon my word, Mrs. Norris, said Mrs. Grant the other day, if Mr. Rushworth were a son of your own, he could not hold Sir Thomas in greater respect. Sir Thomas gave up the point, foiled by her evasions, disarmed by her flattery, and was obliged to rest satisfied with the conviction that where the present pleasure of those she loved was at stake, her kindness did sometimes overpower her judgment. It was a busy morning with him. Conversation with any of them occupied but a small part of it. He had to reinstate himself in all the wanted concerns of his Mansfield life, to see his steward and his bailiff, to examine and compute, and in the intervals of business to walk into his stables and his gardens and nearest plantations. But active and methodical, he had not only done all this before he resumed his seat as master of the house at dinner, he had also set the carpenter to work in pulling down what had been so lately put up in the billiard-room, and given the scene-painter his dismissal, long enough to justify the pleasing belief of his being then at least as far off as Northampton. The scene-painter was gone having spoiled only the floor of one room, ruined all the coachman's sponges, and made five of the under-servants idle and dissatisfied. And Sir Thomas was in hopes that another day or two would suffice to wipe away every outward memento of what had been, even to the destruction of every unbound copy of lover's vows in the house, for he was burning all that met his eye. Mr. Yates was beginning now to understand Sir Thomas's intentions, though as far as ever from understanding their source. He and his friend had been out with their guns the chief of the morning, and Tom had taken the opportunity of explaining, with proper apologies for his father's particularity, what was to be expected. Mr. Yates felt it as acutely as might be supposed. To be a second time disappointed in the same way was an instance of very severe ill-luck, and his indignation was such that had it not been for delicacy toward his friend and his friend's youngest sister, he believed he should certainly attack the baronet on the absurdity of his proceedings, and argue him into a little more rationality. He believed this very stoutly, while he was at Mansfield Wood, and all the way home, but there was a something in Sir Thomas when they sat round the same table, which made Mr. Yates think it wiser to let him pursue his own way, and feel the folly of it without opposition. He had known many disagreeable fathers before, and often been struck with the inconveniences they occasioned. But never in the whole course of his life had he seen one of that class, so unintelligibly moral, so infamously tyrannical as Sir Thomas. He was not a man to be endured but for his children's sake, and he might be thankful to his fair daughter Julia that Mr. Yates did yet mean to stay a few days longer under his roof. The evening passed with external smoothness, though almost every mind was ruffled and the music which Sir Thomas called for from his daughters helped to conceal the want of real harmony. Maria was in a good deal of agitation. It was of the utmost consequence to her that Crawford should now lose no time in declaring himself, and she was disturbed that even a day should be gone by without seeming to advance that point. She had been expecting to see him the whole morning, and all the evening too was still expecting him, 
Mr. Rushworth had set off early with the great news for Southerton, and she had fondly hoped for such an immediate éclaircissement as might save him the trouble of ever coming back again. But they had seen no one from the parsonage, not a creature, and had heard no tidings beyond a friendly note of congratulation and inquiry from Mrs. Grant to Lady Bertram. It was the first day for many, many weeks in which the families had been wholly divided. Four and twenty hours had never passed before since August began, without bringing them together in some way or other. It was a sad, anxious day, and the morrow, though differing in the sort of evil, did by no means bring less. A few moments of feverish enjoyment were followed by hours of acute suffering. Henry Crawford was again in the house. He walked up with Dr. Grant, who was anxious to pay his respects to Sir Thomas, and at rather an early hour they were ushered into the breakfast-room, where were most of the family. Sir Thomas soon appeared, and Maria saw with delight and agitation the introduction of the man she loved to her father. Her sensations were indefinable and so were they a few minutes afterwards, upon hearing Henry Crawford, who had a chair between herself and Tom, ask the latter in an under-voice whether there were any plan for resuming the play after the present happy interruption, with a courteous glance at Sir Thomas, because in that case he should make a point of returning to Mansfield at any time required by the party. He was going away immediately, being to meet his uncle at Bath without delay, but if there were any prospect of a renewal of lover's vows, he should hold himself positively engaged, he should break through every other claim, he should absolutely condition with his uncle for attending them whenever he might be wanted. The play should not be lost by his absence." "'From Bath, Norfolk, London, York, wherever I may be,' said he, "'I will attend you from any place in England, at an hour's notice.' It was well at that moment that Tom had to speak, and not his sister. He could immediately say with easy fluency, "'I am sorry you are going, but as to our play that is all over, entirely at an end,' looking significantly at his father." The painter was sent off yesterday, and very little will remain of the theatre to-morrow. I knew how that would be from the first. It is early for Bath. You will find nobody there. It is about my uncle's usual time. When do you think of going? I may perhaps get as far as Banbury to-day. Whose stables do you use at Bath? was the next question, and while this branch of the subject was under discussion, Maria, who wanted neither pride nor resolution, was preparing to encounter her share of it with tolerable calmness. To her he soon turned, repeating much of what he had already said, with only a softened air and stronger expressions of regret. But what availed his expressions or his air? He was going, and if not voluntarily going, voluntarily intending to stay away. For accepting what might be due to his uncle, his engagements were all self-imposed. He might talk of necessity, but she knew his independence. The hand which had so pressed hers to his heart, the hand and the heart were alike motionless and passive now. Her spirit supported her, but the agony of her mind was severe. She had not long to endure what arose from listening to language which his actions contradicted, or to bury the tumult of her feelings under the restraint of society. For general civilities soon called his notice from her, and the farewell visit, as it then became openly acknowledged, was a very short one. He was gone. 
He had touched her hand for the last time. He had made his parting bow, and she might seek directly all that solitude could do for her. Henry Crawford was gone, gone from the house, and within two hours afterwards from the parish. And so ended all the hopes his selfish vanity had raised in Maria and Julia Bertram. Julia could rejoice that he was gone. His presence was beginning to be odious to her, and if Maria gained him not, she was now cool enough to dispense with any other revenge. She did not want exposure to be added to desertion. Henry Crawford gone. She could even pity her sister. With a purer spirit did Fanny rejoice in the intelligence. She heard it at dinner and felt it a blessing. By all the others, it was mentioned with regret, and his merits honoured with due gradation of feeling, from the sincerity of Edmund's too partial regard to the unconcern of his mother, speaking entirely by rote. Mrs. Norris began to look about her and wonder that his falling in love with Julia had come to nothing, and could almost fear that she had been remiss herself in forwarding it. But with so many to care for, how was it possible for even her activity to keep pace with her wishes? Another day or two, and Mr. Yates was gone likewise. In his departure, Sir Thomas felt the chief interest, wanting to be alone with his family. The presence of a stranger superior to Mr. Yates must have been irksome, but of him. Trifling and confident, idle and expensive, it was every way vexatious. In himself he was wearisome, but as the friend of Tom and the admirer of Julia, he became offensive. Sir Thomas had been quite indifferent to Mr. Crawford's going or staying. But his good wishes for Mr. Yates having a pleasant journey, as he walked with him to the hall door, were given with genuine satisfaction. Mr. Yates had stayed to see the destruction of every theatrical preparation at Mansfield, the removal of everything appertaining to the play. He left the house in all the soberness of its general character, and Sir Thomas hoped. In seeing him out of it, to be rid of the worst object connected with the scheme, and the last that must be inevitably reminding him of its existence. Mrs. Norris contrived to remove one article from his sight that might have distressed him. The curtain over which she had presided with such talent and such success went off with her to her cottage. Where she happened to be particularly in want of green baize. 